Last October, one of the biggest natural disasters in recent history occurred. 73,000 people were killed and 3 million left homeless after an earthquake rocked Kashmir, Pakistan. Millions of people the world over were moved to open their wallets to help victims. But some were driven to do more. Talat Chugtai, a trauma surgeon at Sunnybrook and Women's College Health Sciences Centre in Toronto, was one of those people. When he saw the images of the earthquake victims in Pakistan, he was inspired to travel to the region to lend a hand. And he's here today to share his story. And welcome back, Talat. Nice Thanks. to see you. Thanks for having me. So what, what was in your mind then? Why, why did you ultimately decide to go? I mean, at first I was like everybody else. I looked at the images on TV, I donated money, I was feeling sad for what happened, and then I thought I have this skill set being a surgeon that I could transport and help uh, my people, so to say. And yeah, so, you have roots uh, there, right? Definitely. My parents were born in Pakistan, and uh, I visit there often, so I have a connection there. And I thought it would be uh, unfortunate if I couldn't help them directly. Mm. Tell me what kind of logistics are involved in something like this to get over there and help. Yes, uh, that's important because a lot of people want to help and you can't just fly over there and show up and expect to be able to do things. Uh, it's difficult. You have to join an organization of some sort that has a reputation there. Okay. And so you go with that organization and that makes it much easier. And how long was your stay there? My stay was only about 10 days actually. Yeah, I mean from the sounds of it, it sounded like the work you put in was a month you know, probably a month-long effort. Probably a month or Those so people work. were working there, I mean, full out, right? Definitely. When I arrived, the locals were working there, you can say, 24-7, basically. They were exhausted, so they needed outside help, definitely. Yeah, so when you got there, uh, what, what happened? Where were you assigned? Yes, when I arrived there with my organization I went with, which was Canadian Relief Foundation, uh, they saw that I was a specialized surgeon, so they said I should be deployed to the main trauma center of the country where they were airlifting all the patients from the mountains. So I sort of stayed in the capital city, Islamabad. Okay, and you were actually working in the hospital? I was in the hospital. You, right. uh, you know, I was doing surgery, as I do here. Yeah. And I was, uh, as the patients were being flown in, I was operating on them. Describe to me what those conditions were like. The conditions were, I mean, it's a third world country, so it's obviously not like a hospital here. However, it is a specialized hospital, so you had a lot of the basics that you needed to, to work with. But obviously, because of the shortage and the mass, the volume of people that were involved, mm -hmm. we were short pretty much everything. Yeah. yeah. Now, what are we looking at here? Yeah, these are some of my patients. The first picture you saw was mm -hmm. typical of, you know, a crying kid who lost their entire family who's an orphan now yeah. and who doesn't know that she doesn't have any parents. And, you know, you have to deal with that on top of the fact that they have injuries. And uh, that was probably the most difficult part of the trip. Well, you know, I, I read your account. You wrote an account mm -hmm. about this. And I have to say that the one image that came away with me, um, actually it's an auditory image, when you talked about the children who were crying, mm -hmm. I mean, to tell me what was going when you walk yes. in, I mean, what, what are you hearing? I mean, you come in the morning, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning, and the operating theaters are all connected. It's, they're not separated. So you have five operating theaters and the holding area where the patients are being brought in. And you just hear this constant, uh, all day, 24 hours of screaming, crying kids, and they're screaming for their parents, of course. And the parents aren't alive, usually. These are the survivors. Yeah. So that was this constant, uh, you hear this constantly throughout the day that reverberates in your head. And I still hear it to today, that sound. Really? Mm -hmm. it, what, what effect did it have when you're coming back? Yeah, it, I mean, the effect it has is it, it was okay because I did something and so I thought, oh, well, you know, I did the best I could and yeah. uh, I went and helped out. Um, it is unfortunate. You get that feeling that because of where these kids are situated that they won't get as much help as maybe some other kids would. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a, you know, disappointing feeling, yeah. I guess, yeah. And what about as far as the other staff who you're working with? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, th there are people who came from all over, right? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, the, the locals obviously stop what they're doing. They're helping out. Yeah. And then people came from many countries, I'd say about 30 or 40 countries, yeah. And there was one, I know there's one doctor in particular that you work closely with. I, I think he was sort of head or coordinating. Yes, this is Dr. Valerie Matish. He's a Russian surgeon, actually, who's somewhat of an earthquake specialist. He's gone to the earthquake in Iran, the earthquake in Turkey. And as soon as the earthquake took place that, that's here, you with him. that is me with yeah. him, exactly. And uh, he arrived to, to Pakistan within 24 hours, actually. So he sort of uh, was ready for it almost. And he uh, did not speak a word of English. And yet in that uh, scene in the operating theaters of Pakistan, he was able to basically run the show. I mean, all the local surgeons were looking to him for his advice on how to treat specific earthquake type of injuries like crush syndrome and things like that. Crushed syndrome? Yeah. I mean, a lot of these kids were caught under buildings and under tons of rubble. And so the specific injuries they had were crush injuries. And you treat them differently than other traumatic injuries. Oh, so you're, you're I mean, you're seeing stuff that you'd never seen before, right? Exactly. You can't really simulate it. And being a trauma surgeon, I see traumatic injuries, but... Uh, uh, rarely do I see kids that have been, you know, caught under a building or anything like that. Yeah. So, so. 
And what are we looking at here? This is, is one this of my, a child? Yes, one of my patients, a three-year-old girl who had a very bad uh, injury to her scalp and her head and uh, needed several operations to reconstruct it. And afterwards, and the result ended up being quite good, but obviously uh, quite a devastating injury. Yeah, that is a huge mm -hmm. cut. And, and what about this? This is another three-year-old girl, Nadia. I remember her name, actually, and she had a bad head injury. And uh, we operated on her and, and fixed a head injury she had. You can see the clothes she's wearing are, are donated clothes. You know, they had designer jeans and sweaters that people had donated. So it was nice to see that people had helped out. And uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, other than crush injuries, mm -hmm. what were the most common types of injuries that you were seeing? So as you would expect, unfortunately, we did a lot of amputations and revisions of amputations. So mm -hmm. a lot of these kids did not have a chance to have their limbs salvaged. So we did a lot of amputations. We also did a lot of plastic surgery, skin grafting, and flaps for, for soft tissue injuries like skin and muscle loss. We have to replace that. Uh, I did a few uh, abdominal, chest, and as you saw, head injuries as well. Right. I mean, that, that's your specialty, isn't it? Exactly. As, as a trauma surgeon here, I specialize in traumatic injuries of the chest and abdomen, right. heart, lungs, and abdominal organs. And um, unfortunately, many of those children that had those injuries did not survive because oh. for that, you need a system like we have here arriving to the hospital within minutes of mm -hmm. having that injury. So being in the mountains, that didn't you know, happen, obviously. So were you actually asked or required to do surgeries that you had never done before? Absolutely. Uh, the surgeon in chief asked me, what am I comfortable doing? Of course, I want to help. I said, well, I can pretty much do a little bit of everything. And I am trained in, in you know, plastics and orthopedics during my general surgery residency. And so I you know, did orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery, right. things that I never do here. Just learning on the job again. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. Wow. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, as far as also the numbers that went through, can you give us a sense of, I mean, what kind of volume of patients are you dealing with? Yeah, we're, talk hospital? we're talking about the largest surgical disaster in history because a lot of surviving patients. And so we were doing about 50 to 100 operations a day. And this is in five operating theaters. Wow. Yeah, so it was just a factory of operations one after the other. Yeah. yeah. I know, I mean, we saw a, a few pictures of the children and you mentioned their names, but were there any other children's perhaps, you know, their stories that really, really touched you and you, you know, you came away with? Yeah, my first patient that I operated on, I know for a fact, lost his entire family. He was a one and a half year old boy and uh, we operated on him every day actually because the type of injury he had required a daily operation to try to repair his injuries. And so I got you know close a to that patient. daily operation? Yeah, definitely. Uh, there were some large uh, soft tissue defects that need to be reapproximated slowly, gradually every day. And so that took five operations, one a day. Um, and then there's the story which you know you probably heard about, I told you about you know, kids uh, that had no family yet had one other sibling that survived that were going to take care of them. So, you know, little girls, six oh, years old, yeah. eight years old. There was, that's right. I remember it was a young girl, I think. That's was right. She eight uh, years old? Yeah, the eight year old girl I operated on. And, uh, you know, at the end of an operation, you sort of look for the family if there's any. And in this case, a six year old girl came out of the crowd to say that she, I'm the surviving family member. And the six year old girl will be taking care of this, this eight year old girl, and the rest of the family perished. Yeah, I, how did you cope emotionally with this? How did you and everybody else cope? Mm -hmm. So while we were there, actually, believe it or not, it's not as difficult as you would think because you're actually helping. So you feel mm. good. You get up in the morning, you go to the hospital, you help out a lot of people. And the worst part was probably when you're leaving and you're seeing how many more people need treatment and that you're leaving now and you're not going to be able to participate in that help. So that's difficult. That's interesting. Were you mm -hmm. expecting that? Was it like the fact that it would be so difficult to leave? No, you know. I didn't. I thought yeah. it would be difficult to see those problems right. and uh, I thought it would be difficult in general. But when I left, I felt that now I'm not going to be able to help. So mm. you feel kind of helpless. Yeah. You know, the other thing that crossed my mind as well when I was, um, you know, reading your account and, and also you saying the fact that, you know, you're, there's so many patients coming through that you're treating. What about resources? Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with all this, I mean, you need materials, right? You need equipment. Absolutely. You need antibiotics. You mm -hmm. need, I mean, was there enough of all that? So there was barely enough, I would say. I mean, a lot of mm -hmm. donations have come through, boxes of uh, equipment and sutures and gloves mm -hmm. and things that you take for granted here. I brought a lot of s supplies with me as well from the operating room at Sunnybrook and, and the emergency room. So, but we're barely getting by. You know, during an operation, you'd say, okay, what do we have to work with? What kind of suture material do we have? What instruments do I have? Yeah. And was whatever's it, was it available. substandard at times? Yes, it, uh, it definitely was. You yeah. know, here we're very obsessed about sterile technique and using the right suture for the right organ and all yes. that. Yes. Over there, you have to just sort of bite the bullet and say, we just have to fix it. We use the best we can and get on with it, get to the next patient. And then what does that mean too? I mean, I don't know about follow-up. Mm -hmm. is that, I mean, can you even think about follow-up if the next patients are, you know, that is, that is probably the biggest problem there and that here we have very good, you know, recovery room and post-operative care and physiotherapy and occupational therapy and that's what they're missing there. So these patients, we definitely s saved a lot of them and they survived 
the operation, but what's going to happen to them afterwards? It'll well, be that's very it. You, I guess you wouldn't even know. Like, where would they go? They, they've lost homes, right? They, Definitely. There's no homes to go back to. These are millions of kids, and uh, there's no infrastructure like we have here. There's no adoption agencies or you know, foster homes or social work and uh, organizations and things like that. So yeah. uh, I, I tried to touch base to see what's happening there, and uh, it's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. um, were you even at the point where the hospital couldn't even contain the, the numbers of patients coming through? I mean, did there have to be other areas set up for these people? Definitely. Uh, when I walked to the hospital the first time, I was amazed that there were stretchers and beds and, and patients on the floor in the hallway, in the cafeteria, all over the hospital, wherever they could fit them, because the wards were overwhelmed. Oh, we and should mention, too, when, what, when did you go exactly? I went was... about the third week of October, which was just third, a couple okay. of weeks after the earthquake happened. Yeah, yeah. And, and what was the weather like at that time? The weather at that time was still decent. It was sort of yeah. like a spring or fall weather, and but they were headed towards their winter. So I knew that after I'd left, that would be one of the main issues, the winter there. Yeah. Now, I understand the, w the winter did end up being fairly mild, right? They were lucky that the winter's not as cold as it could have been, but yeah. I think I have seen many reports of a lot of children and elderly people having died because of not having enough, you know, clothing mm -hmm. or blankets mm -hmm. or homes. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also, what kind of reaction did you get from the locals? The, you know, the people you know, who obviously knew mm -hmm. these are foreigners coming in yes. and they're coming to help. It was amazing. I, I knew that they would be appreciative, but they were so appreciative I couldn't believe it. I mean, these were, they were so thankful to us. It was in the newspapers. People would stop us in the street to hug us and to thank us for coming and helping us. They would see our, you know, Canadian flag symbol on our badges and they were, they were so thankful. It was amazing. Mm. Yeah. And what about the, you know, y you mentioned the Russian doctor who you mm -hmm. work with and I'm sure you met others. Um, was there any kind of bond that... Absolutely. Yeah? This is like going to war together, you know. You spend a week or two weeks together in this type of environment where you're dealing with life and death uh, every day. And uh, yeah, definitely these people become friends for life. Yeah. yeah. Um, now I'm just wondering as far as what that region now needs. You know, we've passed through the winter. What does that area need the most at this point? So obviously rebuilding, as you would imagine. So, you know, building homes, building schools, building infrastructure uh, is important. And as far as the patients that I saw, you know, they need physiotherapists, they need prosthesis experts, they need social workers. They have to deal with the social impact of what happened. You know, everywhere here a child would be access to, you know, a psychiatrist and psychologist and social worker and a physiotherapist and get an artificial limb for their, for their amputated mm -hmm. limb. And, and over there they don't have any of those resources, so they need that now. Mm -hmm. do, they, do they need more people like you going over? Uh, I, I could go over and help, but I think the need for sort of a surgeon who's going to do acute uh, you know, yeah. surgery is less now, and they need more of the recovery phase type of people. So if there was to be another team sent, I, I, would, not go, mm -hmm. I would not probably be fit to go on it. I'd send somebody else who's uh, more okay. appropriate. Um, you know, and I'm also wondering too, I mean, about the aid. Uh, I understand that Canada did very well, that, you know, as far as um, the G7 countries went, per capita, Canada mm. gave uh, the most. Yes. Uh, yeah. But I know there are other countries that didn't do as well. I mean, how do you feel about that when you hear that, you know, other countries gave so much after, after the tsunami disaster mm -hmm. or Hurricane Katrina and then a, a, a disaster of this magnitude got less? So I, there's a couple of points, I guess, that come to mind. The first is that it happened to be the third or fourth natural disaster that year. And unfortunately, that's how people, for the tsunami, they all said, wow, this is an incredible event. We need to help. Mm -hmm. Katrina was quite local, so obviously a lot of people can relate to it. Uh, you know, previously, people that had a lot now had nothing. And, and the Pakistan earthquake came at a time where people were a little bit tired, I guess, of helping, uh, if you can believe that. And also, Pakistan is a remote country that you really can't relate to unless you know someone from there or you've been there. And these are kids in the mountains and, and people in the mountains. So it all seems so uh, much and hard to relate to. Mm. I think that was part of the problem. Um, how, how did this experience change you when you came back? Are you, mm -hmm. are you different in some way? So, uh, in general, because I deal with life and death every day anyway, that itself oh, didn't... I like the way you say, oh, I deal with life and death every day, Mary. I mean, that, that itself didn't really change me, and I know that life can change in an instant, and that, you know... Yeah. But the volume of people that got affected by this is incredible, how many people are affected. And uh, I, I felt uh, the sort of disappointing feeling at the end that because these kids and these people are unlucky to have been born mm -hmm. where they are and live where they are, they will get less help and they won't have the same opportunities. I mean, the disaster happened, can't do anything about that. But here, if someone loses a limb or has any of these injuries, you have a lot of support mm -hmm. to get them back to where they were before. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these people will not have that opportunity. That's the sort the of disappointment. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I'd like to know what your parents thought. 
Yeah, my parents, uh, you know, I mean, they, on the one hand, it's always a dangerous area to go to, and so they're, but they were very happy that I was going to go help. And they must have been very proud, Definitely. as we are, too. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much, Tala, for Thank sharing you. that thanks with thanks us today. Me, yes. Thank you. And you can help the earthquake victims by donating to the Red Cross. You can go to redcross.ca and, and you can scroll down to South Asia Earthquake, or also give them a call at 1 800 418 1111. But that is it for our show today. Thanks for watching.